Good afternoon, Santa Clarita, and everyone listening in from around the world. You are right here at KHTS, your hometown station. I am Sharon Brubaker, and this is the Grief Recovery Hour. Thank you, my friends, for joining. I'm so glad you came back today. If you're listening to this program, there's a huge probability that your heart may be broken. It could be from a a death, either recent or long ago, or it could be from the breakup of a romantic relationship, change in health, or loss of a pet. Regardless of the cause of your broken heart, you know how you feel, and it probably isn't good. I'm not going to tell you how you feel because you already know. At best, I can tell you what it felt like when my broken heart occurred, and it was not good. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have an amazing show lined up. We are Facebook Live And we will be answering questions from the Facebook Live, so please feel free to add questions in there. Everything that comes across the air today will be confidential, and you absolutely can call in. I have an amazing guest I want to introduce you guys to, a really great friend of mine. And she and I have some businesses that deal with the heart, and they definitely work together. And that's what I love about this woman. Her name is Azam Aurelian. Perfect. Perfect. I think so. (laughs) And she is the owner of Heal the Heart. Azam also works with broken hearts, but she goes about it in a different way. And that's what I love. I love that there's another avenue to come at that at the broken heart. Isn't that correct? Yes. So Azam, tell us uh, a little bit of exactly what Heal the Heart is. Explain to everyone so they can understand it, what it is. Well, Heal the Heart as my business is is okay awesome getting closer yeah <laughs> heal the heart is a uh, coaching uh, business mm-hmm. in a way that it helps people to get beyond what is blocking them to reaching their goals and their life passion mm-hmm. And uh, blocking them from living a fulfilled and more happier life. Um, My background is in education. I taught God knows how long, but 11 years of that in a high school level. And after that, uh, you know, for 16 years, I've traveled and I trained teachers to develop different programs. I have a master in education and uh, been the educational coach, mentor, and everything for two educators. And then when I felt that I needed to move out of that situation, uh, a couple years ago I uh, founded Heal the Heart um, and went through some other trainings that... uh, took me beyond just being a regular life coach. Um, Having the uh, therapeutic imagery, uh, which is one aspect or has some aspects of hypnotherapy in it, even though I'm not a hypnotherapist, I'm certified uh, therapeutic imagery master. And also um, educating myself and having a certificate from the integrative uh, medicine from the UCLA to uh, with the social emotional art for healing because I'm an artist in my core. And art was what helped me heal myself. And I'm pretty sure you're going to ask me how that process was, <laughs> but it was through that uh, creative process and through some other uh, skills and tools that I had under my belt that I pulled myself out of the dark hole of depression. So I'm using all of that to help people to get out of their dark hole and be able to live a happier life. That's so exciting. That's so exciting. I love that we are dealing with the heart. I love that we can go into someone's heart and help them heal the brokenness of their Mm -hmm. heart. I love that you and I both know what it feels like to have a broken heart and go from that place. So just so I can clarify here, what did you only teach art when you were a teacher? What other things did you teach? Um, 
I taught humanities. I taught uh, social sciences. Uh, I actually, in my second year of teaching, I developed uh, or started the uh, development of a program which became one of the best known in LAUSD before small learning communities were, uh, you know, something. Uh, and it, it was a program that was a four-year program for students who were usually not those who would come to school regularly. Right. But they, they were talented. They were intelligent. They, they could be very successful. But because of their life situation, they, they were not. Right. And uh, so um, bringing 15 teachers together and helping them and helping as a group, as a team, to build a program that would, um, you know, engage students more in school. And after 11 years of that, uh, I landed a dream job, uh, which helped me travel the country and train educators to develop you know, similar programs in different themes in uh, medicine, in um, tourism, in finance, in engineering. The theme did not matter. It was the structure of the program. And that is what is helping me to develop my programs that are very cohesive and it incorporates all aspects of a person. It is very holistic. Awesome, awesome. So for me... After Austin died, Austin is my nephew, he was 10 years old, and I received a call on June 17th that he had died. After Austin died, I felt as if a knife was stabbed clear through my heart. But once my heart recovered from the pain of that death, the light came on for me. And I knew beyond a reasonable doubt that I needed to help grievers everywhere. Mm -hmm. When did that light come on for you? Um... It's unfortunate it was my mom's passing. Mm. Uh, we were at the hospital. She was sitting on the hospital bed, very quiet. And um, every time I ask her to share, you know, because you want them to talk at the end, and she was not. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of the quietness, it was the year that we had four or five fires around Santa Clarita. And... Um, all of a sudden, she started talking, and she said, but this is the time that we need to do the things that we put on hold. Mm. And because, you know, as parents, we put things on hold because of uh, uh, all the responsibilities. So this was a time that we were all married, had our children and everything, and sh they felt that it's the time for them to do the things that they put on hold. And right there, even though it hit me, but it wasn't as evident. And after sh her passing, and there was another layer to this because I was working, when I was working as a teacher, I was working in the capacity of a principal, but as a teacher. So the responsibilities there was huge, and I would get into school at 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, and wouldn't leave until 6, 7 o'clock at night. And, you know, because having close to 400 students in your program, you have to manage all of that. And uh, so overwhelmed and stressed and tired, exhausted, I didn't have time to feed my soul and, my, and you know, warm my heart. I wasn't able to do my art. So with her passing and me feeling that emptiness and feeling her not being there, all of that kept pushing me dark, uh, deeper and deeper into the dark hole. And I came to a point that I remember thinking to myself that, I'm not even smiling. Nothing is making me happy when mm -hmm. I was the one who was running around laughing, making jokes and everything. So that was when I knew I had to do something. And the first thing that I went to was the creative process. And I will explain a little bit more later why it is important. But it, it helped me to get through some of the most difficult times. And... Um, using some of the tools, of course, that I mentioned earlier, is um, so it took me 
quite a few years, like three, four years, to get to a place that I felt whole. I felt that, okay, I can breathe. My, my heart is light. And now I need to bring this to other people. And that is when the Heal the Heart was born, literally, because I wasn't thinking about what name would the business have or anything. It just happened. And, and I, that's how I started. So other than the other modalities that you use, your primary modality that you're using for healing the heart and for having people examining their broken hearts is art. Is it always painting or do you do use other mediums? Well, I use other mediums. Mm -hmm. uh, it is combination of uh, different mediums, writing, um, meditation or visualization, um, actually meditation and visualization, and then the creative process. The creative from my personal expertise is painting. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know how to deal with all of that in order to get the participants to a place that they open up. And uh, they're not really creating an, an art piece. They are opening their heart. They are opening their mind. They are, uh, that creative process helps them to look at what is in front of them and what they're dealing with uh, from a different perspective and look at it in a more creative way because their mind is not focused on the issue. Their mind is, how can I solve this, you know, what is in front of me? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the ideas start pouring in. And then when I use the writing modality, it's they, they actually get to journal and write down whatever comes to their mind. So, um, yes, painting is one of the main ways uh, that you ways. was. Yes. Was there one art project that helped you the most when your mom was with your mom, do you think there was one project that you did that you were like, okay, this is it? I don't know if it was one project. Mm -hmm. It was the mindset. Mm -hmm. Because before my mom's passing, before all the um, depression and everything, I was showing in different galleries. I had, you know, it, I was active artist. Um, and for six years, I wasn't. And when I went back to it... Um, First of all, you know, like anything else, you're rusty. So that causes you some stress. And then I was creating for others because that was the mindset. I came to recognize one day that this is not for anybody else's eyes except me. Whatever this turns out to be, it is me. It is for my well-being. And um, so... I just got canvases. I got, um, you know, like um, uh, notebooks that I, I could paint on. And I incorporated everything that I'm doing right now into that process. So I would just start painting. And in the midst of painting, I would start writing on the same page over and over. It, it was just like um, emptying the junk yes. that was there. Yeah. So about a year ago, I sat in a little, uh, just a sample of a project. I don't know if you remember this, but we got together a bunch of women, mm -hmm. and we each had a note card you gave us, and we had colored pencils, and you oh, would make right. a statement, right, or um, a question or a quote, and then we just picked up the pencil, and we started to write mm -hmm. uh, whatever came to our mind, whatever we felt like doing. And I remember my personal experience was that it was so light and it took my mind away from everything that was going on at that moment. And I just started mm -hmm. to do it. And I still have my little project. And I yeah. look at it. And it brings a smile to my face. Because it just was like I didn't have to think about paying the bills or getting mm -hmm. gas in my car or yes. going to the grocery store or how my kids were driving and, me crazy. And every time you look at that little card, yeah. it takes you back to that moment. Yeah, That is why uh, when... After every workshop, after every one-on-one -on -one session or any retreats that I have, I ask the participants or my clients to take whatever they've created that day 
and post it somewhere that they can see it or hang it somewhere that they can see it on regular basis, hopefully first thing in the morning and last thing at night. Mm -hmm. And every time they look at that, it brings back, it brings them back to that moment that they created it, the, the, the calmness, the sense of mindfulness that they were going through and all the lights that went, they, uh, went off uh, or went on in their mind, it takes them back to that moment. And as you said, a smile will form. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so that day, I clearly remember being stressed, but doing that, I always think anything like that um, projects is very relaxing. Even if you're just putting pictures in a photo album, I feel like it's always so relaxing. I think it's because you leave your life for a moment and you mm -hmm. go to do that. What happens to the person that's totally stressed or under stress when they go to do their projects? Do those projects come out dark or is it a moment of discovery for them? How is, can, can your feelings, your feelings actually come across on the, the project, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Am I saying it right by saying a project? Uh, it's, yeah, you yeah. can call it project. Okay. Yeah. So your feelings actually come across. So what happens to the person that's totally broken then? When a person is totally broken, it's actually none of the sessions are the same. Yeah. Everyone is unique. So I give you an example. Uh, I was working with this client. She really, really was in a dark place. And after going through the first stages like visualization and talking and everything, we got to the painting and writing, we got to the painting. And things were now moving. It was just very dark and uh, very, like, solid. Mm -hmm. So what I did as she was painting, I took the water cup and I just poured it on her canvas. Mm. That stopped her wherever she was, because she had a result in her mind. Mm. She was seeing, I want this painting to look like this. Mm. When we are not working and focusing on the result of how your painting looks like, we are working on the process. What does the process do for you? So that was the first step. She stopped, and then... We started discussing. We started talking about how letting go and being with the flow, in the flow. And I kept bringing her back to the painting and everything and how the paint was moving um, and how beautiful it was coming up to be. The things that were not expected to happen was happen were happening. So as a result, you know, that conversation, it's not about the painting. Yeah. It is about life. Yeah. And, you know, and I bring examples because we have already had our conversation. So I'll pull examples from what we have been talking about. And it just like you see the light, you know, the eyes get lighter and lighter and lighter and that is amazing feeling for me to witness. So that painting took its own form. But our conversation took her one step away from the darkness that she was. Pulling. And then, so would a client like that have multiple sessions? Oh, yeah. And in the multiple sessions, would you see different results mm -hmm. as they are starting to change and grow you will start to see different mm -hmm. results from that there are some who just in one session they achieve what they want to achieve right um but they're the ones who their wounds is deeper yeah and uh we have to clear some of the old wounds yes uh that we need multiple sessions. Yes, exactly. So that's really cool. What can you share real, really quick with us? What was the most amazing discovery do you, that really feels good to you when someone did something that you were just like the discovery that they had? When the client felt to let go of the control. Yeah. That she was trying to control everybody else's life and be there for everybody. And she was forgetting herself. Oh. And then when she recognized that if 
she operates from a place that her cup is full, then she can handle all the things that are on her plates and, you know, take care of others better. It's sort of like you're using all the senses, and that's what really brings Mm -hmm. it all together for you. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about there's a huge aspect to your Heal the Heart business that is coaching. Mm -hmm. And we're going to switch over to what the life coaching part is. So, guys, friends... Join us back here right after the break. Thank you. Hey, guys. Welcome back. Right here, KHTS, your hometown station. You are listening to the Grief Recovery Hour with Sharon Brubaker. And I am so glad you came back to join us for this amazing hour. My guest today is Azam Aurelian. She's the owner of Heal the Heart. She's an amazing life coach. She's been sharing with us all the different mediums that she uses to help clients that are stuck and help them move on beyond that discovery in their life, Mm -hmm. which is kind of cool because anybody can come at any moment in their life. Now, I have that question for you, my friend. I noticed that it says you work with women. Do you work with men as well? Oh, yes. So you work with both? I work with both men and women. Awesome. So she helps clients get beyond any moment in their life, and we're using a different mediums to figure that out, which is really kind of cool. But there's a portion of this business and Healing the Heart that actually has a life coaching portion to it. And the life coaching is different than therapy. Mm -hmm. And we're not actually dealing with life coaching in therapy as a place. It's a beautiful, beautiful process that we all need at some point. But the difference between life coaching is you're actually helping the client figure out the needs for themselves, correct? Figure out the changes they need to make. We're literally sitting with them and dealing with them one-on-one and holding, sometimes holding them accountable to those changes. But you bring a little different aspect to that, and explain that to us. First, explain to us what original life coaching is, and then how you twist it. Okay. So a life coach uh, usually focuses or generally focuses on present and future. Like you said, um, when someone goes to a coach, uh, they identify what, problem they're having, what goals they want to set, and then they develop action steps, and they are usually um, having the coach as their accountability partner to make sure that the action steps that they uh, identified are implemented. The bottom line is the person who goes to a coach, she or he is responsible for taking those actions. But having the coach as an accountable partner is huge. The way that um, I'm different or heal the heart process is different because of my background as an educator and as a mentor and as an educational coach, um, I, we can identify whatever it is that they want to identify right at the beginning. But what I came to realize is that Everyone has some kind of an issue or something that the underlying issue. If that underlying issue is not cleared, yes, then we keep going around this circle over and over again. And um, I'm a master therapeutic Im- uh, imagery certified practitioner. And that gives me the skills and the tools to deal with some of the blocks that the clients are dealing with. So to clear those blocks. Um, I'm not a therapist, but the process is therapeutic, and the process gets them to a place that they can clear those blocks. So through the creative process, because that comes after, um, I'm also certified social emotional healing, um, so social emotional art for healing uh, practitioner. That gives me the additional tools to have them use the creative process to break open. Now, so the step we identified, we overcame the blocks, and then now we are identifying and looking at the issues in a different from a different perspective. Here we can go to 
identifying the goals that are more authentic to what it is they want to see happen. Because majority of our goals is because so-and-so or so-and-so or so-and-so has said it, so I should do the same thing. But when we get to this point after clearing and after opening ourselves up, we get to a point that the goals that we set is more authentic to who we are. Over, and we don't have to deal with that challenge or the block anymore. And after that, the action steps, and then um, I like to call myself guide on the side, yeah. <laughs> beside being the accountability yeah. partner. I'm right there in, with them in, on their journey. Yeah. And um, I call them or text them or email them dear, between our sessions if it is private client or if it is, um, you know, like groups or retreats and everything, I usually post things on my Facebook, and majority of people who attend my workshops, my retreats, they see it and, you know. It's and they like get it. It's just my for them. Yes. That's so cool. That's really cool. I want to clarify real quick that this is separate from grief work. Oh, that yes. grief work, a lot of times... Those moments that you're talking about where they're absolutely stuck, we know for a fact as grief recovery specialists, when, when a, a life change happens, a lot of those things that from their past all start to come up come as up. well. Yes. Those things come up in a grieving experience. Yes. So if you have a, a life-altering event happen, boom, it happens. Mm -hmm. Now guess what happens? Now all of a sudden you're like, this is bothering me. That's bothering me. Things that you didn't even realize that were there that you stuffed down, mm -hmm. they all start to come in the grieving. Azam and I absolutely work together, and we love working together, but I definitely work with the grievers, yes. and you help them be on that part. There's this moment where I work with grievers, and they complete their relationship to the pain, loneliness, and isolation of their broken heart, but sometimes... They don't know what their next move is. Mm -hmm. They don't know what their next thing is. They absolutely are pain-free from the grief, but now what do I do? Mm -hmm. It is not uncommon for a griever, let's say someone who's lost a wife and uh, or uh, their mother or their child to just not know what their next step is. Mm -hmm. And that's where the two of us can work. We work really well mm -hmm. together with getting them to that next discovery. Yeah. I, I see our work as a continuum of yes. healing. Yes, yes. Uh, you come in right at the beginning, at the stage that they're shocked. Yes. They do not know how to deal with day-to-day yeah, you know, stuff that they have to deal with. And as you said, uh, all these other things are coming up that they kept pushing under the rug and everything. So you help them to get through that. And then they come to a point that they're done with the grieving. Um, and now, like you said, now what? Yeah. That is the next step that I come in. And we have done this together before. Yes. That, um, and I help them to even go further, overcoming their blocks, dealing with those issues that they're dealing with. And of course, I want to clarify here that I do have therapists on file, mm -hmm. and that if um, I feel that there are some cases or some stages that are beyond what I'm the expert in, of course. I will contact or I will refer them to that. Therapist. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that we always have to have yes. that opening and they understand that. The, the client has to have a willingness to figure out where their blocks are. They mm -hmm. have to have a willingness to find out what is exactly broken in their heart. And that's all they need. Mm -hmm. You simply need a willingness and you need a guide. You need a guide and someone that's gone before you in that process, and that's what helps you through. I know that some of the work you've done, you've done programs at the Domestic Violence Center, mm -hmm. which I think is so beautiful and so amazing. Share a little bit of, with us what that was like. It is a program that uh, for anybody, not, you don't have to be a domestic violence uh, survivor, but that group... Um, was a mentoring group that I put together for domestic violence survivors. And um, it's a six weeks program for people who are um, dealing with um, adversity in their background and um, helping them to 
gain the confidence that they have lost mm. and understand that whatever happened in the past, yes, it bruised them, it, you know, really to their core, but it is in the past. It should not control them and their life today. So we look at that, the, the, we change the perspective, right? Right. You change your perspective, you change your world. Yes. And um, so we change the perspective, and they get out of being a victim. Wow. And, and after, it's, it literally, you see the switch. And right after that is that when the magic happens, when the confidence starts building up and everything. And, of course, you know, this was a couple years ago, and um, if um, your audience go to my website, healtheheart.com, on the um, testimonial page, uh, there is uh, there are four videos of one of the women who went through the initial program. She's amazing. She walked in one day, uh, or one night with her hair down, we go like, wow, you know, you look really sexy and everything. <laughs> and she explained that she wouldn't leave her hair down because that was the tool that he was using, that he was using yeah. to abuse her. Wow. And after the third session, that is when she came in, and she said right there that there is a job that I want to get, and I'm going to get this job. She went to that interview, and she nailed it, and she's amazing. Yeah. I remember you sharing the stories as you were going through it, and seeing the women transform mm -hmm. was just so yeah. exciting, and hearing you tell the different yeah. stories. And a lot of them were shy when they first started out. They were resistant. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to really do it. And a lot of them hadn't even done anything like that before. But yeah. you walk them through those exactly. little steps, and that yeah. uh, really helped. Exactly. It's actually uh, Jane, her name is, uh, she was talking about that how all the um, resources that a single mother outreach or the domestic violence center and if, uh, all the classes that they have and she used to their max helped her get through the initial stage. Yeah. Of, you know, like what we were talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, and then she came to a place saying, now what? Yeah. What am I going to do? What about me? You know, now I can recognize a, uh, you know, abuser, but what about me? And that is what she's saying, that heal the heart deals with me. Yes. And gets me to a place that I can deal with everyday life challenges that come up, have the tools to get through them. So... Friends, I want to tell you, it is so important to continue growing and mm -hmm. doing your work around whatever that is, even, you know, once a year or twice a year, trying to get into in a program and really grow. Your mm -hmm. self-growth is so important and really giving back to yourself. And it's almost like cleaning house and doing spring cleaning. It, it is. is so important to be able to be there and, and really look at those areas in our life. Mm -hmm. You are creating some new projects, and I really want to be able to share those today. One of them I'm really excited about. So tell us a little bit about that. I, okay, this is very emotional for me. Mm. Um, memory loss is, or maybe has, I don't know, is becoming an epidemic in, uh, all, all over the world. And... Uh, every day you hear about people who are dealing with um, some form of memory loss, whether at the earlier stages or late stages and everything. Uh, someone in my family uh, is dealing with uh, early stages of dementia. And I already, I had last year volunteered uh, with the Alzheimer support group, and I was holding uh, art workshops for the gentlemen, most of them were men, who were coming in with their wives, and their wives were in the support group, and I was being, uh, I was uh, facilitating the art projects with them. Um, I saw the different stages, and now that this year this happened, um, I feel that I need 
for myself as well as for my loved one um, to um, conserve those memories. Wow, that's cool. And, and I, you know, like you said, I do a lot of uh, personal development, uh, both professionally and personally. And um, I'm going to, I'm designing a program for those who are at the early stages of dementia to capture their memories mm. and to help them to feel the confidence that they may have lost because it is, it, it is a hit to the confidence of the person. And so to demonstrate that they can, they're still able to do the things that they could at some point. So conserving their memories and also incorporating some activities with the loved ones to build new memories. Wow. So, oh, yeah, that's great. So it's not just capturing old memories, making sure that they're conserved, but also creating new ones. So when that time comes, the, the ones who are left behind, they, they can remember it and have a smile on their face. Oh, that's beautiful. So. I recently just saw a story where a woman was diagnosed with some form of dementia, and she picked up a paintbrush for the first time. Mm -hmm. And it was literally showing, she said it's the one thing that's keeping her going now, mm -hmm. and that she was never even a painter before yeah. and was not even interested in it. And they're hanging all around the house yeah. now, and each one was a different memory and different time in her life, mm -hmm. and she painted them, and they're framing them, and she said that's what she looks forward yes. to every day. And she's like, as long as I can do this and keep it going, that that's what I'm doing. See what happens when you are involved with the creative process. Different parts of the yeah. brain gets activated. Right. And as a result, the communication between different parts of the brain start getting more and more. That is what is happening in dementia or Alzheimer's, that the communication between cells are stopped. But with this, we might be able to help them keep those communications active between the different parts of the brain active for longer. Wow, that's beautiful. Would that program be for just the person that is diagnosed, or would the family be involved with that? At Do you see it going yeah. both ways? At some point, the family will be involved, mm -hmm. but at the beginning, it would be the person. And this person, you know, I, I say early stages because they need to be able to write. They need to be able to communicate. They need to be able to hold the paintbrush uh, because when they're at the later stages, that communication is not there. There might be another program that I would design for a later stage, but at this point, I want to take it, you know, I want to take it step by step. Yeah. And, you know, make it as easy as possible. So the, they would come, let's say, for example, I don't even know if you have thought about it this far, but I know you have because you're so amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So each week they would have a different medium that they would be using when they came in? Um, in a way, yeah, yes, not just one like oh, medium. It wouldn't like be. I could see them even just like with a tray of sand, just writing in that sand. That just that part of what's that coming to? Painting mm -hmm. the pencils, the writing. Like as you mentioned, I use different modalities. I use movement. I use you know like just walking meditation, just walking and picking up a leaf. Yeah. What does this leaf remind you of? What memory does it bring? And just writing about that, uh, yeah. you know, that kind of a thing. Oh, that gave me yeah. chills. That's yeah. totally cool. All right, my friends, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to find out what amazing programs Azam has stored, how you can find her, how you can contact her. So join us right back here after the break. Hey, 
welcome back, friends. Thank you so much for joining us. You're right here at KHTS, your hometown station, and you are listening to the Grief Recovery Hour with Sharon Brubaker and my friend Azam Aurelian, and she is the owner of Heal the Heart, a life coach that specializes in finding those areas you're stuck in and helping you move beyond those with all different types of mediums, which I love, I absolutely love. We've been talking a lot about what it means to really examine your heart and see what it is to go in those areas and really heal those areas, which I I absolutely love. But let's talk a little bit about the different types of programs that you have. So I know that you do one-on-one. What is that like? Tell me a little bit about what's that. That's private. They come to you. How do you, how do you do that? Well, it is a private session. Okay. uh, And uh, we start every session with, you know, the taking, what is it that you want to uh, what is your, what are your goals and everything, and then we identify the blocks. Yeah, and depending on how many sessions, uh, I don't say like I take care of this in two sessions. It it every person is different, yes. uh, so it can be six sessions, it can be twelve sessions, but it is one and a half hour and it incorporates uh, visualization, writing, uh, painting, and movement, talking. Um, you know, all of that, all the mediums, uh, all the modalities. So you do team building as well? I do team building. Uh, beside the one-on-one, let me finish that as well. Beside the one-on-one, I also do group work yes. uh, in forms of workshops, which two, three hours each, or one-day full retreats, like one coming up September 15th. That's your big baby. Yes. I wanted to leave that one for the end. That's <laughs> oh, why I didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's closed anyway. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, I do team buildings for corporates and businesses. Um, I just had one. I was called back in uh, uh, for the uh, girls' volleyball at Hart uh, yeah. High School. Um, the first group that I did it for three years ago, they just all graduated, and they called me back to to do the team building for the new group. And um, I just love I love every aspect of everything that I do. Oh, that's beautiful. So I left the weekend one because I feel like that's your oh, big sorry. baby. So it's a weekend <laughs> retreat. So explain that one is so exciting. Mm-hmm. And uh, the videos were just fabulous. Women loved it. They had lunch. They had a little mm-hmm. wine. They mm-hmm. really did some heart research. So you yeah. have one coming up this Saturday that's all sold out. But tell us a little bit of what it's going to be like. Well, this one is going to be by myself. I usually collaborate with others, but this one I decided that I want to do it by my uh, by myself. Uh, we are going to incorporate walking meditation, building healing mandala, uh, having opening circles and doing a quick ritual, community building between the women who are there, and then um, you know doing the movement and the sound bath, and all of that is directing people or uh, um, getting people to a place of calm and forgetting about their stress and revive and renew. But at the same time, what happens with this process is that healing takes place. Whether you like it or not, things come up Mm -hmm. that you get to deal with at that point and clarify or it, they come to light for you so you w- you know that you have to deal with it. But it's going to be an amazing day uh, at a private location in Ogo del C. Uh, food, and it's basically the, the catering it in, uh, wine and everything. Wow, yeah. that sounds amazing. That's a whole day That's of whole self-care. Day. Yes. It really is. looking at your heart, really what I was talking about, doing mm-hmm. that self-care to help yourself just take that moment, mm-hmm. that one moment in time, and pluck it out, mm-hmm. and then grow, learn, and your yeah. teaching. That's just so amazing. Yeah. Do you work with teens and youth? Other um, than, like, the Valencia High School, do you do that? No, uh, Heart High School. Oh, the Heart High School. Yeah. Um, if um, I don't do it one-on-one, okay, uh, I would have some programs that are groups. Uh, th- that feels a little bit better and more right to me right uh, instead of doing one-on-one yeah Yeah. awesome yeah tell me and all of our friends here how can people find you Uh, my website is healtheheart.com and i'm all over facebook instagram 
and um, they can call me at 661-644-3465. Uh, my email is azamirelian at healtheheart.com. And um, just uh, those are the venues that they can reach me at. And I am going to put her information, tag it into the Facebook Live so you guys can find it there. When someone contacts you, do you do a one-on-one -on -one session first just to see which way they're going, or how do you do that? Uh, it's always the first 30 minutes is on me, Okay. Uh, whether it is on the phone. If it is in person, it's a little bit longer, Right. but uh, no charge for the first uh, session. Uh, the following sessions, depending on how um, often we are meeting, uh, 90 minutes is for, for 125. All the supplies, everything is provided. They just have to bring themselves and what they want to do. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really amazing. I want to leave you all with this, that grief is a normal and natural reaction to a loss of any kind, my friends. Grievers are not broken. They do not need to be fixed. When your heart is broken, you do not need to be fixed. Grief happens in the heart. It absolutely does not happen in the head. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing, and one of the things that Azam and I offer that we can offer a griever is the ability to listen. Last night I was at City Hall, and s the city of Santa Clarita named the month of September Suicide Prevention mm -hmm. Month, which was really, really amazing. But we talked at City Hall last night about being the listening ears for uh, people that are around us that are really struggling and having a hard time. And so I want to leave you here with this thought. If you can imagine just a big giant heart with ears hanging off the end of it, that's what you are to the hurting person. Mm -hmm. That's what you are to the person that's absolutely hurting. Absolutely listen to them. Listen to what they have to say. Do not try to fix them exactly. because they're not broken. Do you realize that if we give someone that safe place to talk, it could change their life. It really could change their life. So, my friends, thank you so much for joining us here for this hour. Sharon Brubaker at the Grief Recovery Hour. KHTS. I will see you next Wednesday. Have a great day.